Last time we met, we talked about component selection. Today, we'll build on that by briefly discussing load development methods and describing how we do it. As always, your mileage may vary, which is a good thing. It means you've learned to think for yourself. It's difficult to separate component selection from load development, but we've done the best we can so that today we can put the choices we made in the last video to work and start doing some real world reloading. There are a few things you're gonna need if you wanna play this game. Get a good chronograph. We use the Garmin Zero for its simple reliability and minimal footprint. Its companion app has everything you might need and nothing more. Well, it'd be nice if it calculated BC, but we still recommend the Garmin. Choose an app to evaluate your targets. Hornady's Fordoff has this functionality built in, but we like to use the Range Buddy app because it's far less complex and we can grab screenshots for our records super easily. You'll want either a 100 yard measuring tape or a laser rangefinder. There's no excuse for being imprecise when doing load evaluation. We simply must know we're shooting at an accurate distance. If you're at the club range, you're good to go on that account. But on a public range, you're on your own. You'll also want a stable shooting position. This is critical. Either a quality solid and sturdy shooting bench or shoot in a prone position. You must be able to call your shots so you can be certain that that last flyer is really due to the load and not you having had too many Red Bulls. You see, we need to evaluate the effects of the changes to our loads. So we need to shoot well. We need to shoot very well. We let the targets tell us about the changes that we made. That felt good. What's the goal of load development? Seems like a silly question, but we have heard some silly answers. The goal is simple drive directly and efficiently to a bullet and powder combination that shoots well enough in our platform to provide acceptable accuracy and precision. Notice that I did not say, we want to find the best load in the history of loads or the one load to rule them all. We need to meet our goals so we can work on the single biggest problem we'll ever face in our shooting experience, ourselves. We need to get a good load and go and shoot, plain and simple. There are three primary methods of load development worth discussing here, and it is our belief that, regardless of which method you use, you will need to shoot a ladder at some point, and you will need to progress to larger shot population samples in order to continue improving your load development. One of the primary methods of load development is the OCW, the Optimal Charge Weight Method. This method involves shooting different increments of powder charge at the same cartridge components, typically in groups of three or five shots for each increment. The goal is to find the most central average point of impact between them, which indicates the charge weight that is providing the most consistent point of impact despite slight variations in loading or external factors like weather. Another method is the Scott Satterley method which is known for its efficiency and involves 10 shot tests. It starts with the chosen powder and bullet and the shooter loads 10 rounds, each with a different charge weight in small increments. The goal here is to find the most accurate charge weight and then refine it with seating depth adjustments as quickly as possible. And then there's the modified ladder test. Some shooters combine elements of the ladder test with the other methods. For example, they might start with a ladder test to find a node for barrel harmonics, then refined the charge weight testing in that range, followed by seating depth testing. We ascribe to a modified ladder test methodology, and we cook up a different mix of those three primary methods to fit the situation we're currently working on. Sometimes we already know everything there is we need to know from previous experience, like 180 grains and a 30 out six loads. So we know what doesn't work and we ignore that in favor of what does work. That's an important concept to take home. Focus your energies on finding what works rather than spending time on what doesn't work. So each of those three primary methods aim to help you get meaningful data, but they are predicated on you performing a meaningful and informative test. There's a lot of talk on the interwebs about what kind of testing should be done when evaluating performance and load development. Let's just start off by ignoring the statisticians for a bit here. No one can satisfy those weirdos. And we'll start with a few assumptions to help guide us through the process. We'll set boundaries on what's reasonable and how to know when we left the realm of reason. One, 
We want to test in a way that gives us the most information for the lowest cost in money and time. Two, components don't grow on trees. We need to be deliberate about how we consume them. Even if the test shows horrible results, we should still learn something important from that test. Three, we need to shoot enough rounds in a group to have confidence in our conclusions or inferences. Three shot groups don't tell us half of what we need to know, but they can function as gross reality checks. Five shot groups are where our confidence starts to grow. After that, we're into limbo and the statisticians guild wants your soul. Four, we need a plan that has an end point. Drive as directly as possible to the go or no go decision. At the end of each test, we should have a clear choice and the information needed to make that choice based on fact and data. Whether or not we like the results, they are the results. Facts over feelings. And finally, number five. Take good notes and lots of pictures. After each test, we should be able to easily define the next step in the process. Record your progress, or you'll be doomed to repeat tests in an endless loop of frustration. Well, how do we design tests that are logically valuable when evaluating loads? We have to start with some kind of load, then methodically change one element of that load at a time and contemplate the results of that change. We drive to that beginning load as quickly as we can, then do recursive testing alongside that first load as a control group. The results of each test must be meaningful. For example, when changing powder charge, the magnitude of that charge must be enough so that we can see a meaningful difference between each charge's resulting target. Generally, 0.3 grain is a decent charge increase. Think about this. If we're looking for a stable load, we want that charge to be insensitive to minor variations in charge weight, say plus or minus 0.1 grain or so, without meaningful change in velocity. If we do tests with a 0.2 grain change, we'll be at the bench all day looking for a difference that will never show up enough to be noticeable. And most powder measures and scales, for that matter, have a resolution of only 0.1 grain. So really, we don't know if we threw a 50.1 grain load or a 49.9 grain load. That's what plus or minus 0.1 grain means. That's a 0.2 grain spread. We need to test larger steps to ensure we can reliably throw accurate enough charges during loading. Conversely, if we change charge weight by 0.5 grain, we might miss some important changes in group placement or shape. Split that difference. Go 0.3 grain with changes. Not too small, not too big. If we shoot a 0.5 grain interval, and we have a window of good performance that begins at a powder charge of 40.4 and ends at 40.9, giving us a 0.5 grain overall window, we could miss that window and only see the bad results at 40, one good result at 40.5, and then another bad result at 41. And we would conclude that there was no one to be found, incorrectly, that is. If, however, we choose 0.3 grain increments, we would see 40.0 grains bad, 40.3 grains decent, 40.6 grains good, 40.9 grain good, then 41.2 grains bad, and we would know we have a window to explore between 40.3 and 41. We then ladder inside that region looking for the edges of that window to both prove its existence and define its limits. Ideally, we choose a load centered in that window, which gives us good ES and SD and good group shapes and sizes. We must match the resolution of our tests to the range of sensitivity in our particular use. Now we know we're changing charge weights with a 0.3 grain increment. What else do we know? Logically, we know we want the highest velocity we can safely get good results with our chosen powder, so that we get the best ballistics and terminal performance. Is more velocity always better? No. We're looking for the right velocity for our particular barrel and bullet combination. Here we can simply decide that if a velocity falls below a certain threshold, even if the load shoots into one hole, we won't be using it because it's just too slow. We typically load 50 to 70% of the min to max spread going up in 0.3 grain increments. Essentially, we're ignoring the lower half of the book values for this very reason. We try to get between six and eight distinct charges to test the entire high end of that scale. Five shot groups, 
to be minimally statistically valuable, each point three grains from the next. Each load goes into its own target with consistent barrel temperatures and ambient temperatures. We compare adjacent groups looking for a flat area covering three or more targets where the group hits the target with the same center and overall size. We know that, eventually, we have to pick a load and go spend time on the trigger. That's really the ultimate goal, right? That is not to say that we stop thinking about how to improve our loadings. Far from it. Having found an acceptable or good enough load to meet our purposes, we constantly think about how to improve that group. We routinely shoot comparison targets using 10-shot groups to contrast a new variable against our current best load. Or maybe we start up with a new bullet for evaluation and compare that against an analog target from a development of our current load. We're constantly asking ourselves, is this new bit better than what we've been getting? If the answer is yes, then we shoot larger populations of that new thing alongside of our standard load for comparison. During load testing, we use square point targets and we focus our aim on the corner of a target. We adjust our scope up two minutes. Bring it up a mil, just so you're not hitting that corner. So that you're always aiming at a sharp corner. Let your group fall above your aim point. Don't pay attention to that group. Evaluate your group when you're done shooting, but keep that corner clean so you have exactly the same aim point from shot to shot. So let's put it all together. Now, some of this may be a review of our previous video, and that's unavoidable, but it's always good to revisit the key takeaways. Our flow is as follows, usually. We adjust the order and complexity as the unique situations dictate. More in-depth considerations for precision loads, a lot less for plinking, and for hunting we go strictly for first shot perfection with absolute reliability. First, we choose a caliber. Second, choose a projectile. Maybe choose three manufacturers projectiles for the same application. But note, if you're shooting cup and core bullets, stick with cup and core bullets. If shooting monolithics, stick with that. Do not interchange them in the same rifle without first cleaning the barrel all the way back to shiny metal first, or you'll get wonky results. We don't know why, it's just a thing. Third, select a few powders via the thought process in our previous video, Components Selection. If you haven't watched it, now's the time. Load 10 rounds of each powder, one grain below max, as feelers for initial testing. Break that into two groups, shoot two groups of five of each powder, letting the barrel cool completely between groups. We do this to quickly find if one or more powders just shoots like shit. And immediately we ignore that powder ever after during this testing. It's highly likely you'd never find a decent load with that powder if it shoots badly one grain below max. If the groups look good, move forward with that powder. If the groups look bad, forget it. It'll never work for you. Fourth, narrow down to one particular bullet. Stick with that bullet from now on. Fifth, with the good powders from step three, shoot ladders with your chosen bullet to find what velocity your particular barrel seems to prefer. We find that, by and large, if you know that preferred velocity, most all projectiles of similar weight will also enjoy that velocity. That's a barrel thing, and we listen to our barrels. Sixth, if needed, shoot comparison five-shot groups using good powders to settle on just one powder to work with. Seventh, review all of your saved targets for that particular slug and powder combination, looking for a window of similar performance. Choose a powder and weight that provides the best ESSD numbers and best group shape and size. Then, move on to testing seating depth. We have found some very good groups that had fairly lousy ES and SDs, and those loads shot out to a thousand yards very well. In that situation, the Statisticians Guild would tell us to shoot larger group sizes, like 25 or more shots in a group, to see a more clear and honest picture of what's going on, but then we blow our barrel out testing. So we just acknowledge there's something weird going on and we move forward. Eighth, seating depth. We've mashed out a bullet and powder charge that performs well enough. We now fine tune that load by carefully adjusting seating depth, looking for changes in group size and shape. It's a small magnitude effect, but can reshape your group and increase your hit percentages significantly. Ninth, 
Go back to any step along this path and start over, substituting one component at a time. Only change one thing at a time, or you destroy the test. We shoot our standard load as a baseline, and contrast the performance of any new item in step 9 against that baseline. This way, we have a workable load on the shelf while we're looking for something better, all the while continuing to enjoy that standard load every day. Maybe one day we change our standard load to something incrementally better, and maybe not. And tenth, remember, this is supposed to be fun. And now, as always, success criterion. What's our success criterion today? Hit percentage. There, I said it. Now we can all go home. Hit percentage is the probability that your next shot will hit the target in a pre-described circle of random distribution. Of course, we're always working to shrink our groups, but it's important to remember that at some point we need better tools of measurement and methods to focus our energies so we can actually see the improvement. And that next level of measurement tool is statistical analysis. Sooner or later, we'll have to grapple with the Statisticians Guild if we want to improve. So go forth and be fearless. The sooner you get to that level, the better. We'll see you in our next video. Thanks for watching.